Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us. This is the Citizens Institute on Rural Design um, presenting our rural design webinar series. This webinar will be recorded live. If you'd like to ask um, any questions of our presenters or moderators during the course of the webinar, you can do so in the chat box. The Citizens Institute on Rural Design is a leadership initiative of the National Endowment for Arts in collaboration with the Housing Assistance Council and Building Community Workshop. The Housing Assistance Council, known as HAC, is a national nonprofit that focuses on communities across rural America through investment and assistance with affordable housing and community and economic development initiatives. Building Community Workshop is a nonprofit community design firm that works with communities across the country to elevate their strengths and help address their needs through design. Our third webinar is the Rural Design Webinar Series um, focused on rural design for a new future. Across the nation, small communities are adapting to a global pandemic and calls for racial equity. How can design and community engagement adopt to these challenges? Today, we're featuring speakers leading historic preservation at many African American churches, providing entrepreneurship on opportunity for their Native American tribe, and working with students to develop affordable housing in the rural South. I'm so pleased to bring you these wonderful speakers today. We have Brent Legs from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Heather Fleming from Change Labs, Rusty Smith from Rural Studio and Auburn University. Um, please welcome our first speaker, Brent Legs from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be here with you today and my colleagues, and I look forward to highlighting the program that I run at the National Trust, which is the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. And I want to start with this first image. We all remember the tragic events that happened in 2017 in Charlottesville, where white men wearing khaki pants, polo shirts, holding tiki torches on the campus of University of Virginia would rally around a Thomas Jefferson sculpture to advocate for their ideology of hate and to advocate for an, a modern day form of Jim Crow. In essence, we wanted to respond and to showcase that the linking between culture and preservation practice was a solution to help mitigate some of the social crisis in our nation at that time. And our view was that it was critically important to begin to tell the full American story. So we remember what happened in 2015. At Mother Emanuel in Charleston, South Carolina. A white nationalist. Would massacre nine Americans inside of a sacred house of worship. In many ways, this is the America that we live in. I wanted to highlight this image, not for shock value, but to highlight that in 2018, one of our own National Trust Historic Sites was vandalized with these words, and it just affirms once again the importance of American history and historic places that can either be used for hate and negative ideology or that can be used to provide a positive impact to our nation. This building right here is the second oldest extant standing black church building in the United States. It's located in Nantucket, Massachusetts. The African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund is about creating space, making space to expand the American story and American culture. And in essence, we view the Action Fund as an emerging social movement in service to our nation. And I want to highlight 
some stories and places that we are promoting and celebrate through the Action Fund. One is Mount Zion Baptist Church. I'll highlight more about the current work to reimagine the reuse of this remarkably significant historic church building. It's located in Athens, Ohio, and in many ways, this is the prototype. It is the example of Black resilience, Black achievement. It is the example of a historic building that was designed by Black minds and built by Black hands and has been at the epicenter of the Athens Black community for more than 100 years. This church matters. The African Meeting House, which is located in Boston, Massachusetts. It is the oldest extant Black church building in the United States, constructed in 1806. This is where the abolitionist movement came together, a multiracial coalition to advocate against their disdain of the institution known as American slavery. The legends like William Lord Garrison and Frederick Douglass Harriet Tubman and others spoke at that pew. Then of course you have places like the home of Harriet Tubman in Auburn, New York. We all know that Harriet Tubman, who was once called the Moses of her people, would lead the Underground Railroad movement and lead enslaved African Americans to freedom. Her beloved home stands in Auburn, New York, as well as the home of the aged, and this place has a story to tell. Rosenwald Schools. If you haven't heard about Rosenwald Schools, you should know this American story. It was born in the mind of the legendary educator and activist Booker T. Washington as a response in a crisis in Black education. In many ways, Rosenwald schools stand as the legacy of his bold idea. And in many ways, it is one of the most remarkable and successful social movements in American history. More than 5,000 schools built in 15 Southern states. The gentleman here is Robert Taylor, the first licensed professional black architect in America, first graduate of MIT, Booker T. Washington recruited him to start up the School of Architecture at Tuskegee, and Robert Taylor and others would design the first Rosenwald School building plan. I hope you have heard of an under-recognized female poet, Lucille Clifton. This is her home in Baltimore, Maryland. A group of artists have acquired the space and envision an art-centric program to honor both Lucille Clifton, who was the Poet Laureate of the State of Maryland, two-time Pulitzer Prize nominee. She's a legend and a former contemporary of Langston Hughes. This place matters. Many of you may not have heard of the National Center of Afro-American Artists, which is located in Boston, Massachusetts. This grand estate was acquired by the founder, Elma Lewis, who was a visual artist. And after attending a national conference in Boston for black creative intellectuals, she would found the center. And this is an anchoring cultural institution in the heart of the Roxbury neighborhood in Boston. I'm sure you have heard about the legendary civil rights activist and musician, stage actor, the legendary Paul Robeson. His former home where he retired is located in Philadelphia and it anchors the West Philadelphia neighborhood and the programming here is about uplifting and empowering the black community. I'm sure you've heard of 
John, and hopefully Alice Coltrane. John Coltrane inside this ranch style house would spend a week in a second floor bedroom and compose one of his greatest masterpieces called A Love Supreme. Following his death, Alice would record in their basement studio her first five albums. This place, in sight of the recent past, highlights an example of Black love, Black family, and how a historic home was a space for stimulating art and creativity. I hope you've heard of August Wilson, his former home in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. August Wilson wrote a play, 10 series about the Black experience in this city, and in particular in this neighborhood. And a group of artists, family members, and others have organized themselves around the reuse, preservation, and activation of this space. And you can see here in this photo how they have leveraged the, the rear yard to be able to put on one of August Wilson's plays. Perhaps you've heard of the legendary blues musician, Muddy Waters. His home stands vacant in Chicago, Illinois. Muddy Waters is considered the father of modern jazz and blues in Chicago. And we are supporting an heir, his granddaughter, who is leading the preservation effort to reactivate this historic space, as well as his rehearsal studio that was located in the basement. There are other American stories that aren't as uplifting, stories that shifted the national consciousness of our nation and really was a catalyst for the American Civil Rights Movement, and that was the murder of Emmett Till. The Emmett Till Interpretive Center is currently working in Sumner, Mississippi, a rural location with a population of 450 people to tell this important civil rights story so that our nation never forgets, but also to leverage the power of place and preservation as a strategy for community revitalization. So in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which we have all recently heard about, in 1921, there was a racial massacre in Tulsa. It destroyed what was once known as Black Wall Street and a thriving and prosperous Black community. The only edifice that still stands as a physical remnant of that massacre and tragedy is Vernon AME Church. And I'm delighted to say that we provided our largest grant of $150,000 to help them to restore the historic stained glass windows. So Birmingham, Alabama was once known as Bombingham. And in 1956, the home church of the legendary civil rights leader, Fred Shuttlesworth was bombed. The Parsonage building that you see on the right, actually on Christmas Day, December 25th, 1956. Thankfully, he was not, he and his family was not murdered in that assassination attempt on his life. Today, the church building stands as an interpretive center to tell the civil rights story in Birmingham. I wanted to highlight the ways that communities can be engaged related to complicated histories, can take ownership and reclaim that history to be reminded of the cultural legacy that exists there. And the shadows in the background is the historic 16th Street Baptist Church. We all remember the tragic events that happened in the fall of 1963 
and the assassination of four young girls. But today the church is telling two stories. It's highlighting the architectural story. This church building and the parsonage residential building adjacent to it was designed by Rayfield Wallace, who is the second licensed black architect in America. And of course, they're telling their civil rights story and have created a remarkable exhibition that is displayed in the church basement. So perhaps you've heard of the voice of the American Civil Rights Movement, Miss Nina Simone. This is the home where she was born, where she would learn to play the piano and would begin to be that champion for human rights. We partnered with four New York City based visual artists to develop a stewardship plan to restore, interpret, and to return back this formerly vacant historic house to the local community. It's located in Tryon, North Carolina, population of 2,500 people. And what's beautiful is they are leveraging African-American cultural heritage, Nina Simone's legacy to envision and grow a creative economy. So the last image that I want to highlight for you is Claiborne Temple. And I think this is relevant to the moment that we're in. The Black Lives Matter movement is beginning to link political activism and economic justice. And it's not a new strategy. It's one that was developed in 1968. This is where Dr. King led 15,000 sanitation worker mark, sanitation workers on a march advocating for equal pay, fair employment. This was an example of the civil rights movement becoming more sophisticated when it linked political activism and economic justice. Claiborne Temple stands today vacant, but is led by a strong and capable organization that will return this historic place back to the community. Preservation today, modern preservation, is really about equity and racial justice through the lens of preservation practice and architecture. This moment calls for new forms of partnership, interpretation, and community. It is the way that urban and rural communities can tell their story and create that new sense of community. So in closing, I wanna highlight briefly for you a project that is led by CERD that is looking at the reimagining of historic Mount Zion Baptist Church in Athens, Ohio. So when we inter intervene in the preservation of nationally significant historic buildings, the first thing is to do no harm. It is to ensure that the stewardship strategy is, is the right approach to make sure that the physical evidence of that history is preserved. It is retained for future generations to interact with that history. You see the historic building on the left and, and partly the vision is a, a hybrid approach, rehabilitation of some of the interior spaces and a restoration treatment for the exterior so that this building always looks and retains its architectural and historical integrity. But this historic space has spatial limitations. So the idea is to create a web of cultural spaces and experiences for visitors based on the Mount Zion Baptist Church Historical Preservation Society's vision for preservation and reuse. They wanna create a knowledge hub Heritage Tourism Hub and an um, and, um, arts space, a space of culture to be able to engage the community in this history, thus needing additional buildings for support. So you see the little blue house is being imagined as a cafe. The church building is the knowledge hub for cultural events. Here you get a sense of the spatial interior layout of the building. 
The current basement does not support reuse. The, the ceiling height is too low. So needing to accommodate some changes to the ba basement space to be able to make that functional for contemporary use. And then the main program programming happening in the historic sanctuary space. There's also a need, as I shared earlier, to create a adjacent supporting spaces to support programming. And some of the ideas is to acquire and to reuse this historic house for that purpose. So once this final report is available, you will get a sense of a comprehensive and sophisticated preservation strategy that's being considered for the reuse of historic Mount Zion. I'm hopeful and our partners are hopeful that what's developed here, both in process and in impl implementation, will become a national model for other vacant historic church buildings and sites across the United States. The thing that I want to leave you with is that the Preservation Society as a new and emerging organization, it takes time to build technical capacity to do preservation work, especially in rural markets where the fundraising capacity is limited. It takes a level of sophistication to make informed financial arguments and decisions that have lasting impact in historic buildings. So I want to challenge any artist, any preservationist, any philanthropist that are listening to, to this webinar, support this organization in realizing their vision. Help them to establish co-stewardship agreements and long-term partnerships that will sustain their programming and the preservation and stewardship of this historic site. It is a bold vision for Athens, Ohio, it is important that the black community has a space where black culture thrives. And it's important that this community can leverage its African-American history for all of the citizens of Athens. Thank you so much. Next, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Rusty Smith. Hello everyone. I am not Rusty. My name is Heather. <laughs> uh, let me see. Advance the slide. There we go. One too far. Hello and welcome to any Native brothers and sisters on the call today. Yes, eh? do Sha'a Heather Fleming in this year, and I'm a member of the Navajo Nation and also the executive director at Change Labs. Bitane Nishle, Bilagana Bashis Chin, Tordachini Deshiche, Ado Bilagana Deshanale, Tronanist Ize Nasha, Echehe. And I wanted to start today by illustrating, sorry, this is getting back a hold of the screen. Start by illustrating what a typical Change Labs member looks like. So this is Brent Todlina, and he's the owner of Ashki Bada Moccasins on the Navajo Nation. And Brent runs his business from his home by necessity. And throughout his entrepreneurial journey, he will run into a variety of hurdles to legally operate a business from the res. I've added the most common hurdles we hear from the business owners in our community. Oh, shoot, it keeps going faster than me. <laughs> the lack of reliable internet access to reach new, cumber, new customers, lack of labeled roads, um, which makes getting an EIN number nearly impossible. The lack of recognized roads also makes it nearly impossible for Brent to get Ashkibada on Google infrastructure like Google Business. Um, Brent eventually wants to have a storefront or a leather workspace that isn't his couch, but the lack of retail infrastructure on the res means that people have to run their business from their home. 
Um, and to build a storefront from scratch requires a business site lease to access land, and that's a multi-year process that most people can't afford from a finance or time perspective. And then the lack of availability, lack of ability to own land has even more dire side effects to entrepreneurs like Brent. There's already a shortage of banks on the reservation, but now try and access a small business loan when you have no collateral. My co-founder Jess and I have spent the last four years documenting and categorizing these challenges that native entrepreneurs face and Brent's situation is not an isolated one. Last month, um, Change Labs released our first research report on the state of doing business on Navajo using an established set of indicators developed by the World Bank. Sorry, I'm reading, okay, by the World Bank. Okay, and the World Bank methodology measures the state of doing business in 190 nations around the globe. And analyzing that data revealed that the Navajo Nation ranks amongst the worst 15% of nations in the world for doing business. We're about on par with Central African Republic. And the most challenging thing about Change Lab's work is that there isn't any one thing that needs to be fixed. It's this entire entrepreneurial ecosystem is complex and it's layered and we map it out, it looks like this. And some of these challenges are more prominent than others, but what we've learned is that like any complex system, it's difficult to make change to just one of these supports and then expect all of them to improve. To really affect change requires a holistic approach. And speaking of that change, this is the change that we want to see, Change Lab's um, mission statement to empower Native families to define and expand their own livelihoods by removing institutional barriers to entrepreneurship, eroding social barriers, and expanding their access to capital. Basically what that means, or what Change Labs does, is we provide creative workspace tools and resources and knowledge for Native entrepreneurs. And we have five programs or five ways that we do that. We run a residency program for Native artists and Native designers. We operate a co-working space to bridge that gap in physical infrastructure on the reservation. So in our little space in Tuba City, you can get a desk, you can get on Wi-Fi, you can print, you can use our little marketing tools. And then we're most known for our business incubator for Native American entrepreneurs in Navajo, Hopi, White Mountain, Apache, Pueblo. Each year we select 20 high potential entrepreneurs to enroll in this program. Ugh. And I mentioned that we launched our first research report earlier this year. Um, that's all part of our data initiative called Doing Business, where we're creating a doing business indicator that's specific to the Navajo Nation to help drive our own advocacy initiative, but also to drive evidence-based policy changes. And I'm gonna talk about this again a little bit later on, but Kinship Lending is our character-based loan program for entrepreneurs. And this is a very new program that we created in response to, um, to COVID-19. We also create a number of resources to help entrepreneurs leapfrog some of the common barriers to entrepreneurship. One of the biggest ones being business registration and certifying as a Navajo-owned business. Uh, and it was actually through an NEA grant that we developed this tool called buildnavajo.org. And it's um, just an online tool that helps you understand how to register a business, how that differs from certification on Navajo, and then um, an overview of the business site lease process so that uh, everyone can understand the steps to get through that multi-year, multi-step process. So my friend Courtney Spearman emailed me the invitation to join this panel and she asked me specifically about Change Lab's COVID response. And I initially thought, I'm not sure what we're really doing differently as a result of COVID. But in creating this presentation, when I had to really think about it, um, it turns out there's a lot that we're doing differently. So these last four slides 
are the big shifts that we've implemented in just the last five months. And the thing with Navajo, though, is that we were already in an economic crisis before COVID hit, so now we have an economic crisis on top of an economic crisis. And a lot of that ex is exacerbated by the fact that we don't have consistent internet access across the res. So transitioning online wasn't a simple prospect for most of our community members. And as a result, we're doing things now that we hadn't anticipated before, like paying for, purchasing, acquiring, setting up connectivity equipment so that people can participate in programs. Um, fortunately, one of the coaches on our team has an IT background and runs an IT business in addition to the work that he does with Change Lab. So he's been able to champion that. And then we're also to the point now where it looks like we're going to be paying directly for some people's internet bills just so that they can um, get from very low bandwidth speeds to bandwidth speeds that enabled them to uh, join the modern world. And for those who are able to just transition online, we launched a, a getting online video series for artisans. We turned our residency program, which initially was targeting um, visual artists and graphic designers. We quickly transitioned it to a more like a web designer in residence whose sole purpose this next year is to help 10 business owners get online. And then that's been supported by um, grant money like a BBB grant that we received that's going to help Change Labs pay the hosting fees for any of those entrepreneurs that we help get online. Because even though a hosting fee can be as low as like $215 for an e-commerce site, that's $215 that most people in our community just don't have. And then finally, we're also promoting Res Rising, which is um, a platform that we launched at the beginning of 2020. It's basically a digital yellow pages that includes more than 500 native owned small businesses across the Southwest. And for the majority of them, Res Rising is their first or their only online presence. And when we created Res Rising, we wanted it to be a gateway for them to continue building their online presence and tap into new customers and new markets. And I think that's definitely critical now more than ever. So it's it's quickly turned into a great um, COVID tool for us. So besides transitioning online, we're also doubling down on creating workspace in our community. The Navajo and Hopi Nations are in the process of reopening this month, but Change Labs secured permission to reopen our facilities in mid-May for co-working and for entrepreneurial support. We're also harnessing CARES relief money to 7X our footprint, creating even more physical space available to entrepreneurs in our community. Um, and then we've also just decided to offer all of this space for free to select businesses through 2021. But the need for land, for space, for infrastructure and in tribal communities for business is greater than that. To get from a 15% ranking to even a 50% ranking is a huge lift. So we're also trying to get the support from Congress on the easy stuff. Um, a lot of communities and neighborhoods on Navajo are littered with abandoned federal buildings from the old BIA days. And these buildings are not accessible to our community leaders because they're federal property. And they take up really valuable real estate, real estate that could be used by local businesses. So we've launched a campaign and a petition to clean up the BIA buildings in native communities and get them released back to our local leaders for economic development initiatives. And we collaborated with Tommy Gray Eyes, um, a local Navajo artist who's been wheat pasting photographs of entrepreneurs in our programs entrepreneurs who desperately want and need retail space or workspace, but they can't access it. He's been respacing their photos on these buildings to show what's possible if we invested in our local business owners. Whoa. We've also been working on getting money out the door. So kinship lending that I mentioned earlier is a brand new program for us that we created within a week, thanks to the support of our partners and our donors. Um, 
we raised 150k within a month to lend to 37 new borrowers and like many organizations we've been working on aggregating resources and um, putting them online creating a web page that we edit weekly looking specifically for grant and loan opportunities that are applicable to businesses that are located on tribal lands um, one of the biggest opportunities available to the people in our community is a brand new program, the Navajo Nation CARES Relief Grant that targets Navajo small business and artisans. And Change Labs is actively collaborating with the Navajo Nation Division of Economic Development to support the rollout of that new grant program. And then finally, again, probably like many other organizations, we've had to become extremely flexible in our work and specifically our internal policies. We've had COVID sickness within our immediate team, deaths within our families, heavy trauma within our communities in the past five months, and this all puts a strain on everyone on the team. It shifts everyone's priorities. And so Change Labs had to shift too. We're supporting staff who need time for community work, uh, my co-founder, Jess, I think she's the best example. In addition to working for Change Lab, she also co-founded the Navajo Hopi Families Relief Fund in April and has raised nearly six million within four months to distribute food and supplies to families all around the reservation. So she and the other founders of this initiative basically built the Navajo Nation's largest distribution company within a month, in addition to just, you know, doing her other work. One of my other team members has decided to run for office in her community to help those in need. We have other team members who need time off during the day to deliver food to family members, to drive elders, to get tested and so on. And I think all of us felt initially stressed trying to do all of this work in our spare time and also trying to do our Change Labs work. So we changed our policies so that our community work is our Change Labs work and then hired two more staff to help redistribute um, the workload. So I'm looking at this list. I'm really proud of what we've been able to accomplish and change in the last five months. And I'm grateful to Courtney for forcing me to think about it because I think there's much to celebrate. And of course, I'm also grateful this opportunity to speak about it. And unfortunately, I have to jump to another um, webinar. But if you have any questions, here's my email. And thank you so much for having Change Labs. And now I'd like to hand it over to Rusty Smith. Thanks, Heather. It's really nice to be here um, with you and Brent and sort of talk about some of the work that we're doing in, in West Alabama and beyond and, and uh, you know, hopefully connect some 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 dots across where we all have sort of this uh, collective entry, uh, interest in um, uh, place based work. Um, Rural Studio is um, is is part of Auburn, Auburn University's architecture program. Uh, we have a five year undergraduate architecture program. That's that's pretty normal in. Um, uh, sort of architectural education space for undergraduate students. Typically, students will come to the university as true freshmen right out of high school and study for five years. And at the end of that time, uh, they leave us and can become uh, practicing uh, licensed and registered architects. As part of their time, uh, at our, their five years at Auburn University, they have the opportunity to, to come out to Rural Studio, which is a, a residency-based remote program about three hours uh, away from campus. Um, it is located in rural West Alabama uh, and the students come to us from anywhere depending on what what time of their um, their education they join us from anywhere from one semester to up to two years of that five years of study. Uh, the, the program is uh, kind of in the language that we use it's a design build program that simply means that students both design and build um, all of the all kinds of community infrastructure in uh, this this sort of underserved uh, uh, community where we live and work. The program was started uh, almost 30 years ago uh, by Samuel Mothby and DK Ruth, and it, it just had a couple of a handful of really simple premises. The first was that 
the best way to learn how to do things is to actually do them. So students often come to university to be invested in knowledge, and, and we've found that uh, it's only through action and experience are we able to transfer that knowledge uh, into know-how. Um, as you know, sort of uh, uh, Heather alluded to when she sort of talked about that in Change Lab's work, where there's um, you know not one single thing that needs to be fixed. There's a lot of approaches that you have to take. It's really complex. Um, we also have found that when you're trying to do really difficult things that you don't know how to do, uh, the, the best way to do them is to, is to try to tackle it together. Uh, so the work is extraordinarily co collaborative um, uh, because of the complexity of the work. And the last uh, sort of premise behind the program uh, when it was founded was that you know, everyone deserves uh, uh, access to, to good and dignified design, whether they can afford it or not. And that architects as professionals uh, have uh, a sort of a professional responsibility that when they see folks in crisis, uh, that we need to act. Uh, we are located in Alabama. Auburn is over on the east side of the state. Uh, Birmingham is our financial center, kind of in the, the north central part of the state. Montgomery is our capital city. Uh, Selma, Alabama is located right in the belly button of the state. And then uh, Hale County, where we are, we're operating, is over on the western part of the state. And this relationship between Hale County and Selma and Montgomery is really, really important. We're in this area that's called the, the Black Belt. It's a historically uh, agricultural area. Um, it has uh, a great history. Uh, uh, it has a, it's a, a sort of a, a remarkable, uh, holds a remarkable place in, in you know, sort of obviously the, the ongoing um, uh, sort of movement for civil rights and voting rights. We are in an area that's considered to be persistently impoverished. As many of you here know, that's uh, simply a federal designation. That um, means that a, a county has had uh, its 20% uh, or more of its residents live consistently and persistently in poverty for 30 years or more. Of course, as we begin to look at populations in these counties, um, you know, those uh, 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 the percentages, uh, when you begin to look at childhood populations, elder populations, and, and populations of color, those percentages can jump, uh, you know, quite high, well above 30, 40, and even 50 percent. Uh, just as an aside, there are about um, 370 to 380 persistently impoverished counties in the United States. Uh, over 85 percent of them are rural. So this issue of persistent poverty uh, is, is particularly a rural problem. That said, it is a, uh, this, this place where we work in West Alabama and Hell County is a, a place of, uh, of great wealth, uh, both financially and, and, and historically. Um, but it's also a place of sort of ab absolute abject poverty. It's, it continues to be remarkable how folks live um, uh, in these sort of uh, uh, hidden away um, rural places. Now, the truth is, uh, you know, sort of 30 years on, not many folks live, not many of our, our neighbors and, and clients live in, in tar paper shacks like that one that I just showed you uh, where the Harrises were living when we first worked with them. Uh, this is what's replaced uh, our housing stock. It's the second and third hand trailer home. And it's pretty stiff competition. Uh, this is uh, New Bern, Alabama, where we uh, live and work. It's a thriving metropolis of 186 people. Um, we're extraordinarily fortunate in that we ha still have a federal building, a little white building on the left is our post office, and we have an operating grocery store, a mercantile right next door. Most towns this size don't have either of those institutions. We're fortunate to have both. This is the building that uh, where we work. It's affectionately referred to as the Red Barn, and if you're familiar with architecture school, when you come inside, you'll see that it, it, it operates and functions just like any architecture program um, around. Our students live and work on a, a working farm there in New Bern, uh, understanding kind of food access issues and food insecurity issues, knowing where your food comes from is really important to us. Our students, um, uh, as I said, it's a residency program. They live with us. We have dormitories that the students themselves have, have built. If you're familiar with Rural Studio, you know that we have a long history of material experimentation. Uh, we experiment on ourselves, not our clients. So these are some small, what we refer to as living pods, where our students that have designed and built over the years, where they live in residence. And you'll see that they are, are neat and tidy and studious, uh, just like students anywhere uh, in America. Um, the first project that uh, Rural Studio ever uh, designed and built, it was really, the program was not even intended to be a program. Uh, it was to sort of work with Shepard and Alberta Bryant to replace a house 
for them. This was the Haybell House that was built uh, about 27 um, year, designed and built about 27 years ago by students. Another house, uh, the Harris House, uh, also called referred to as the Butterfly House. Uh, beginning to think about how a, a, a house can can both be functional and noble and actually can be, respond very uh, 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 significantly to its climactic conditions. Um, as I said, our students look like uh, students uh, at any university uh, in the United States. Uh, they come out to us and the, on the very um, uh, when they very first join us, they're involved in net down work. So that uh, <laughs> moving from a knowledge space to a workspace. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, uh, they've been donated a couple of barns here. They're taking down one of the barns and categorizing the materials, sort of learning how to put something together by taking something apart uh, that might have been built really well in the past. Uh, all of the work is real. So they work with real clients, with real budgets, with real sites, uh, and, 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 and hopefully with, with real positive outcomes. In this case, in this example, the students are working with Rosalie Turner. Uh, who was living in a home that was literally falling down around her. She had two adult sons that had been displaced and the students are working with Rosalie to understand what kind of home they might be able to provide for her uh, that could help bring uh, her, her uh, sons back home to live with her. Um, the students, uh, as they, they work with clients, they also work with all kinds of professional consultants, architects like Glenn Merkett here, um, uh, uh, structural engineers like Anderson Inge, uh, and through this work, the students learn everything that they need to know about um, how they might uh, not just design their, their buildings, but actually how they might be assembled and how they might build them. And then the students actually get out and do build them. And this is pretty typical of how they work. Uh, this little white house to the left is Rosalie Turner's house. Uh, it's a simple idea. You keep Rosalie sheltered in place in her home, build a replacement home on her existing property right in front of the new home, move her into the house, and then tear her existing house down. In this case, the students also uh, designed uh, this home to be built in phases, so there was a second wing to be built onto the house that would bring her son's home. Here's the house under construction. The interior of the house is it's getting finished up. You can see Allie here. She's actually uh, the interior wood in the homes as well as those bricks on that back firewall that she's assembling all came from that barn that you saw the students uh, disassembling. And this is Rosalie and her two sons on the day they moved in, uh, moved into the home. So it's a really sort of open, spacious, uh, airy interior. You'll find uh, that the, all of our buildings, whether they're houses or, or uh, community projects, they all uh, uh, feature sort of really prominent, hopefully beautiful uh, front porches. The front porch is a, is a really important both um, environmental space and, and, and social space and historical space for our community members. When, um, this is, and this is the house as it is today. When the, this literally the day after Rosalie and her family moved in, uh, the uh, students here you can see Rosalie's little white house there, the unfinished first phase of the new house to the left. The day after they moved in, the students uh, sort of tore down uh, the, the original house and then ultimately built this, this additional wing off to the side, providing this really, uh, while it's a very small house, a large courtyard for, this, for the family to live in. We do uh, all kinds of work. This is a church, Antioch Baptist Church, that the students have designed and built. Um, uh, we uh, Park Pavilion in Perry Lakes Park, a fire station for Newburn. This is it under construction. This is it today. Uh, became a, a community meeting place that was so useful and significant to Newburn that eventually there was a, a, the, another group of four students designed and built this town hall, which provided not just a place for the town council and the town to meet, but also provided a consecrated place to vote, which is uh, sort of access to voting is extraordinarily important in this part of the world, as you might imagine. A group of students working with Boys and Girls Club standing in front of a, a, a framing model that shows their client that they know how to build what they propose to build. A few months later, the students actually on site building that, that, that actual building that they just proposed and the Boys and Girls Club um, today, which also as you uh, features this sort of prominent uh, big porch that we sort of talked about. Um, another project, uh, uh, a little uh, abandoned bank building in New Bern, Alabama that was renovated as a, as a uh, uh, um, Library for the town of Newburn, bringing both after school programs and high speed internet to, to Newburn. We continue on um, 
with our housing work, with uh, where we've designed and built countless sort of prototypes of housing uh, for our clients and our community. We've understood uh, these, dealing with these issues of housing affordability, that, that houses have to be durable, buildable, weatherproof, and secure. This is sort of the, the, the floor that we build on. But we also think that in the affordable housing space, that um, you, we can be aspirational. We think that houses should, should have a sense of presence, we think that they should be designed to foster a, a sort of a sense of community. Uh, they need to, with intention, sort of uh, contribute directly to the health and wellness of both the folks who build them as well as the, the, the residents that live in the homes. They have to provide long-term accommodation for both aging in place and sheltering in place. And finally, even though they're, they're built locally with local knowledge, local materials, uh, and, and local uh, 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 labor force, they have to be well-crafted. Uh, we do have a number of uh, houses that we're working with external partners. These are just a few of them that we have where we are actually working with external partners now to provide these houses out into the larger world. In our location, Rural Studio works uh, sort of in a charity model of, of production where we design and build and, and give uh, whether our, our, there are houses or our community projects to our community members. Uh, but we're working now with external partners uh, around the Southeast to offer our uh, house plans and our technical assistance to other housing providers uh, to build these houses in their own service areas, in their own delivery model. And these are just a, a couple of examples of those. These are a couple of houses that were built over uh, in Chattahoochee Hills, uh, Georgia. And then an example of a home that was built uh, by a Habitat for Humanity um, uh, affiliate in Lee County, um, Alabama. Uh, it was just the last couple of minutes that I have. I did want to talk about um, sort of what design means to us as we work in this place. And it really is about communication, always, uh, you know, sort of being engaged in your community. And, and, and it's, it's not just providing sort of solutions, but it's actually beginning to try to work and have conversations with our community members and our clients to understand uh, what is useful. We often think of design as problem solving. We, we actually think uh, that's sort of a side effect of design. Problem seeking is really what we're, what we're heavily invested in, really beginning to truly understand the issues that our community uh, faces. Uh, we often think about when listening to, uh, to our clients to try to understand, we, we think about asking uh, questions better, but we've actually found is, is all of our clients and neighbors and community members actually help us ask better questions. We'll often find that the questions that we're asking aren't the right questions. Um, and so working together with our community, we learn to do that better. We also think about uh, uh, sort of actions, about verbs. We don't, in the, as an example, we don't think about affordable housing. Affordable housing is a thing that's a, a noun. When you, when you see affordable housing in the landscape, you know what it is. You say, there it is. We really think about issues. We think about housing affordability and how that uh, extends well beyond just the brick and mortar problems uh, that architects can address, but into kind of the systemic uh, uh, sort of deeply rooted issues that lead to these challenges of housing affordability. And we also think about this issue of income and wealth, that often we think that if we can just solve income problems, it will address many of our issues. But we found in many of our communities, it's this issue of wealth uh, uh, is, is, is one of our significant challenges. And so beginning to work with partners to understand how to do that is important. And then, we, and then finally, we, we try to look through just trying to solve for what things cost. We often address problems by thinking about, you know, what does it cost us to do that? Or what does it cost us to do this other thing? But we, we think it's more important to ask a question, you know, what does the house afford? Or, or really, um, maybe even more importantly, to begin to ask, what is the cost of inaction? This uh, cost of doing nothing is extraordinary. And if we can begin to, to, to better understand what the cost of inaction is, this notion of, of what it costs to uh, tackle some of these challenges that all three of our organizations are trying to face, I think we're much further down the road towards addressing them. So thank you very much. Uh, and I know uh, Evelyn and Dan, you guys probably want to open it up for some questions. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Brent. So for um, everyone listening, uh, you are able to ask questions in the chat box. If you're on your screen for the presentation, you can press Q&A and submit 
um, a question for for me as a moderator or for the two presenters that we have remaining. Again, Heather had to leave, unfortunately. It looks like we have a couple of um, questions in the chat box already. Um, are there any tips or best practices for building the capacity of ordinary citizens to take on increasingly complex planning processes or even basic architecture? Um, is the question, Brent, I know you were mentioning this a bit when referring to the process with Mount Zion and having a kind of a small board of uh, retired or uh, otherwise employed um, participants, if you wanted to take a stab at that. Yeah. What I tell emerging nonprofits and the same thing that I share with established organizations that have been around for three to five decades to focus on short term priorities for advancing the mission of the organization. And that's often focused on preservation planning. That's focused on fundraising and that's focused on nonprofit management. What I've seen in my 15 plus years of, of work experience is that the fun part for many emerging organizations is their passion and love and connection to the history, thinking about the programming and visioning for the reuse of that history. But the minutia and the details and the structure needed to move forward those great and creative ideas happens at the board level. And it is pragmatically looking at what are our six month or one year benchmarks for moving forward our preservation planning activities, our fundraising and our nonprofit management. And if, if newly emerging organizations can focus on those three priorities with six month benchmarks, that will then begin to teach you how to work more focused and more effectively and hopefully advance your mission more effectively. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, and for both of you, I know Heather spoke a little bit about some of the challenges that um, her organization was shifting in response to coronavirus and both of you guys work in these really community engaged spaces where you're designing to gather people together. Um, how has your work changed over the last um, five months and uh, what do you hope to continue to achieve? Rusty, I'll let you go. Um, yeah, <laughs> I hope you jump in there, Brent. It's really com complicated. You know, being an academic institution, uh, a lot of the answers to that are, are uh, uh, Evelyn are, are emerging, and we just we just oh, we just started school uh, this week. Uh, we just got our first group of students back on the ground working uh, uh, in since uh, the last five months. Um, when we had that big shutdown back on, uh, I think almost across the United States on you know kind of March 12th to March 13th, um, we had about 24 hours to shut down all of our project sites uh, and, and send our students home. So. That was a little bit stressful. We spent the summer um, working with the university to try to understand in the kind of ever evolving kind of information um, um, uh, milieu like like we all are have, have been to try to figure out how to open back up safe, safely and successfully. Um, you know, our communities are so uh, challenged. We're operating in some of the highest risk uh, communities uh, regardless. And then you sort of look at the overlay relative to the communities uh, that are so in negatively impacted by COVID-19, you know, we're right in the thick of it. So uh, protecting our, our, our neighbors and our community members and our clients is first and for, you know, sort of foremost. Obviously getting students back on the ground um, working in a safe manner has been uh, extraordinarily important. We can't do our work unless we're physically in the community working uh, 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 hand in hand. So uh, what we've done is, is you know, is we uh, we are fortunate in that we we have some upsides. We do work uh, almost, uh, you know, when we when we've got job sites of which we have have uh, seven that we've opened back up, uh, they're outside 
uh, we work in small groups. We typically work in groups of three to four students with an instructor. Um, we can safe social distance. We have a lot of uh, guidance, um, obviously not just through the CDC, but because we're, uh, you know, sort of work on job sites. Uh, OSHA provides a lot of uh, uh, safety precautions that we can follow. So we get a lot of good guidance to do the, to do the work. But it's absolutely critical. You know, the, the issues that our community faces haven't gone away uh, because of COVID-19. They haven't stopped. Uh, and, and if anything, they've gotten worse. And so uh, that's, that's been, you know, job one is to get back. We're, we're working where we're working because of the challenges that our communities face. Um, and, you know, uh, we've got some really hardworking, dedicated students who are committed to keeping their eye on the ball understanding what their job is um, and doing the things that they need to do to keep their community members uh, safe and secure, their clients safe and secure and, and keep, us, keep us open and working. Um, they're really super. They, you know, our students are um, really uh, focused on, on the job at hand. And so it, it's really, you know, they're our security in some ways that will allow us to continue work. Um, we have done a lot more of this. Um, uh, with particularly with our remote clients, uh, we're we're, we're uh, doing a lot of we have we have clients that are building houses throughout the southeast, so providing technical assistance where we normally be face to face, traveling a lot on job sites, we're doing a lot more of this. We have we have just recently been able to travel, and so um, we are doing a little bit of critical traveling with some of our uh, uh, housing providers in the southeast to meet face to face. But we're trying to be really strategic about. Uh, when we have those face-to-face -face meetings and making sure that it's that it's a really good use of that of, of that sort of a uh, little bit of increased risk. Thank you so much. And with that, I think we have uh, run out of time for this program. But again, anyone who is interested in learning more about the Citizens Institute for Rural Design or the speakers for today, um, you can reach out to CIRD at ruralhome.org and I'll be happy to answer any more questions. Thank you so much for joining this presentation. Thank you to our presenters. Um, thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts. And uh, stay, stay safe, everyone. I hope that this presentation offered some inspiration to all of the rural communities out there uh, working to make a positive message in today's world. Thank you.